This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining us today. With me is Richard. <laughs> Richard is just you and me today due to some technical issues and, and whatnot. But speaking of technical issues, we were talking about backstage about the stock market crash last week. Last week, I guess it was. I don't pay much attention to the stock market. Yes, yeah, so a week ago, a week ago today, last Monday, uh, we're taping on Monday. So yeah, Monday the whatever, whatever the Monday is prior to the twenty uh, seventh. Uh, so the twentieth. Yes, yeah, the twentieth, I believe it would be. Yeah, yeah. No, it was interesting. It was a, a Monday, kind of a Black Monday sort of a, a moment, and the uh, stock market was down big time, and uh, nobody seemed to know why. Everybody, you know, the the news headlines talked about. Uh, uh, a, uh, a, a a real estate company, uh, Evergrande Real Estate in China, uh, not being able to pay its creditors to the tune of three hundred billion dollars, and you know that could be a problem for uh, any economy, not you know not to mention just China, and it could also have some ripple effects. So that I mean that's what the media was blaming the whole thing on. I don't know whether or not. Uh, Evergrande will get bailed out by the Chinese government or whether uh, the Chinese government will decide to make uh, an example of them, sort of like uh, the uh, United States government tried to make a, an example out of Lehman Brothers uh, back in, in, in 2008 9 uh, But we'll, so we'll see. Uh, but the other thing that happened, uh, and, and that's just in the last few days, is that the 10-year interest rate is starting to spike up. And whenever the 10-year interest rate spikes, that's usually a sign that people are starting to believe, or investors anyway, are starting to believe that inflation is in fact uh, a real concern. Uh, up until for the last for the last few weeks, the uh, ten-year interest rate has been remained relatively steady, uh, and uh, you know, kind of attributed to the fact that market players are, are figuring that the inflation will, uh, that the, the Fed will uh, do whatever is necessary, tapering or uh, stopping the tapering the, the purchase of bonds to the tune of 120 billion dollars a month, tapering that off a little bit uh, soon enough in order to event to avert an inflationary surge. But uh, now the market is saying, "Yeah, I don't think so. I don't. We're, we're a little bit more worried." And uh, and you know, interest rates depend on you know our, our, the tenure in particular is subject to a lot of different uh, inputs. One of which is inflation. Another of which is uh, what the Fed does, and the Fed has been buying and selling uh, treasuries. So you've got uh, an artificial player, or a, a, uh, a player in the market that has no, has a bottomless checking account, uh, na namely the Fed, uh, arguing against market forces which don't have uh, an unlimited checking account, but which are also very concerned the, about getting uh, sub one percent or sub one and a half percent interest rates in an, in a uh, five percent inflation economy that that doesn't make anybody any money in the long run so it's going to be a really interesting time in the in the stock market for the next uh, well yeah, for, for for the duration uh, you know until we have a uh, a reset in stocks which everybody is talking about but hasn't happened yet it's going to be an interesting time yeah i've I've watched the stock market most of my life, and then I've, the last 15 years I've stopped paying attention to it because it seems completely disconnected from the reality of you know average, the average economy, the economy of the average person. It's like completely disconnected, and so it doesn't actually tell us very much, you know, unlike it used to kind of tell you generically how the economy was go was doing, how the you could kind of generically make that case. It doesn't seem to be any connected anymore, and. Now, whether that's true or not, and whether, you know, the media always likes to look for a reason. But there's almost never a single reason these things happen. You had, what, El Salvador went to Bitcoin as, a, as an official, not the only official currency, but as an official currency. And so there's kind of some stability and instability in what the future holds. And Lord knows with, the, with COVID and, and the, what, the medical tyranny or the, not medical tyranny, just the authoritarianism of government action these days how how can you actually invest in a business in the future if you don't know if it's going to actually be allowed to be there you know there's well, yeah that's a big concern in china tencent uh, and uh, other uh, internet companies uh, uh, jack ma's company uh, alibaba those have uh, been had their hands slapped jack ma disappeared who was you know this you know multi-billionaire uh, executive in china he disappeared from from public sight for uh, for months 
uh, you know, with with a whole lot of uh, speculation whether or not he was ever going to reappear again. I think he has, but but uh, you know, the uh, the uh, patience of the Chinese government, uh, Chairman Z or whatever his name is, with uh, the uh, uh, corporations uh, flexing their muscles, uh, sometimes in defiance of the central government. He's lost, you know, the, the chairman of, of China, China has kind of lost his patience with uh, anybody hogging the limelight and taking it away from the, from the central government, the, the Chinese Communist Party. So, you know, there's, there's tension there. There's tension, obviously, uh, in the United States because we have, uh, with COVID and even before COVID, been spending money at such a pace and borrowing money at such a pace that it is almost impossible to quit borrowing. We have a situation where corporations are borrow, borrowed up to the hill. We have, we have a lot of zombie corporations. We have corporations that the only way they can continue to pay the interest on their bonds is by issuing new bonds. It's a, a classic Ponzi scheme. And once new money of it from the Fed ceases to become available, then the chips start falling and they'll uh, bring down a lot of solid corporations along with the uh, zombie corporations uh, and create a, a snowball effect. I mean, that's that's the fear among market bears. The uh, market bulls say, well, you know, the Fed has bailed us out for the last going on 40 years now. They'll continue. And they will as long as they can, but at some point they won't be able to anymore because inflation will become the, uh, the, the uh, a larger scare than depression, and when that will or, or stagflation, which is a combination of depression and inflation at the same time, uh, when that when that happens, nobody knows. In the meantime, savers are making no money at all, sub zero percent real interest rates. So if you have a savings account, forget about me being able to to retire on the interest. Uh, ordinary people are are, pray, are are essentially locked out of markets. The only way you can make money in markets is through speculation. The only people who have uh, who can borrow money to speculate are those who are already very, very rich, very well off, and that's not most of us. No, it's not. It's not a good thing for a, our average average person. It's you know it kind of seems far off. All this economic policy seems far off, but the kitchen table is getting empty because it costs more to go to the grocery store and that is you know a fundamental danger but it's moving on to fundamental dangers democrats have introduced the protecting our democracy act and if there's ever any time these people name something you know if it's saying protecting our democracy you damn well know they're doing anything but they're probably <laughs> doing the opposite yes. <laughs> yeah do they really care about democracy i don't think they do but a bigger question is, and us for third party members, do they actually even have a moral leg to stand on as they're sitting here talking about protecting democracy as they sue to get Green Party members and libertarians off the ballot, change ballot access laws to make it harder for, you know, non-politically connected people to actually run for office and make a real difference? They're talking out their rear ends, if you ask me. But what do you think, Richard? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's clear that democracy is important in name only. I mean, the whole concept of democracy uh, is flawed in the sense that uh, a democracy where the majority rules absolutely is an absolute, an absolutist totalitarian state just ruled by the majority as opposed to a, a single dictator or, or an oligarchy. Uh, and, but it can be just as dangerous to anybody who is a minority and a minor, whether that's a minority of 49% or the ultimate minority, a minority of one, if the majority says, you have to run, uh, you know, jump, or say how high when we say jump, you are uh, at risk uh, of uh, having to jump really high uh, in order to survive. Uh, and that's that's the situation that majority democracy uh, creates. Now, the founders of the U.S. had, uh, you know, realized all of that and created a, a republic or a limited democracy, uh, a, a system of government where it wasn't an absolute democracy, but a limited democracy where there were certain things that the fun, that the majority could not do, uh, that the majority cannot uh, wantonly uh, destroy the currency. We had a gold standard to start out with in, in the United States. The majority cannot uh, arbitrarily uh, imprison people. The majority cannot uh, do the things that now 
Democratic, in particular, majorities seem to want to do, and I shouldn't say just Democratic majorities, uh, on economic issues, as economic majorities want to uh, essentially transfer income from those in the upper middle class to those in the lower middle class, uh, talking about taking from the rich, but in effect, in effect, they're taking from the only from the upper middle class. The rich take care of themselves very well. Thank you very much. Uh, but on the on the Republican side, you've got majorities who want witness Texas, want to drastically uh, il minimize or eliminate abortion rights. Uh, you're talking about both Democrats and Republicans who want to uh, censor the internet very, very drastically. We have a, a situation now very similar to the uh, pre-internet days where there are only three or four organizations that control all of the news that emanates to most people. You've got the, the three networks, ABC, NBC, PS, and their their uh, cable affiliates, and you've got the New York Times, and to a certain extent, the Washington Post and the LA Times, controlling most of what gets reported. And if you want to get your voice out on what used to be a free and unfettered internet, forget about it, because now Facebook, Google, YouTube, uh, and uh, Twitter and all, all all of the rest of the uh, the internet giants are doing as much as they can to censor in whatever way the U.S. government wants them to censor. Because hey, if they if you don't censor YouTube, Facebook, uh, Google, we're going to regulate the heck you can we're going to regulate you out of business. They're on the you know the, the 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 executives of the internet companies are on the hill one day complaining you know being threatened with more regulation and on the hill the next day being threatened uh, with uh, uh, either increasing or decreasing their censorship depending on what the issue is. Yeah, it's this notion that the internet companies are censoring of their own free will is ludicrous. It's always been ludicrous. The the power of regulation or just the threat of regulation. It doesn't even matter. We're just going to run you through a, a, you know, the kind of a legal rectal exam is enough to say, no, you know what, never mind, I'll comply because I don't want to have a bunch of government lawyers digging through all our paperwork. It's just, a, it's just a pain in the butt. It's a distraction. It's easier to just to silence those people over there. They'll just be quiet. They won't listen too much anyway. And the government's the bigger threat eventually, for now. But eventually, all these, you know, these customers are going to leave to go somewhere else. And the bills will not be able to get paid. You know, they're all end up like Sears. It'll take a long time. Well, that's that's the, that's the optimistic interpretation. The the more pessimistic <laughs> interpretation is that they'll shut up the large existing internet companies, and they'll make it impossible for competitors to gain traction. The government will. Yeah. Well, that's the plan, right? Let's hope that we don't let them do it. But there's also other thing. John Stossel is now suing Facebook, alleging defamation over the fact check label. Now remember, John Stossel. When I was a kid, he was the big consumer rights advocate, right? He was the guy who ran out there and looked for all the consumer uh, violations from businesses and whatnot. And at some point, he changed to being a liberty rights activist, kind of. Well, yeah. I mean, he had the same wake up call that a lot of liberal, uh, former liberal libertarians have, which is that uh, I mean, he was, he was you know, looking out for consumer rights and he eventually the light bulb went off and he figured out that the biggest uh, uh, impediment to, to consumer rights is not private companies who are actively trying to get your business, trying to uh, get repeat business. The, uh, the, the, most, uh, the, the biggest threat to consumer rights is in fact the government who is trying to prevent competition in order to uh, line the, their 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 uh, re-election campaigns by taking com uh, contributions from the existing players uh, in, in return for legislating uh, com com competitors out of business through regulation and so forth. So he figured out that you know the biggest the biggest threat is not is not corporations, uh, although they can be, but the bigger threat is government agencies and the government itself. Uh, and so you know that's that's how he became a libertarian, and he's been. Uh, on the uh, on the uh, watch for government malfeasance ever since, and uh, part of government government malfeasance is uh, very uh, suspectly manipulating the public narrative on healthcare, uh, to put it broadly, uh, COVID to, to put it more particularly, and when he 
quoted some, you know, I think it was government figures and facts and so forth to make uh, an anti-regulatory, uh, disease regulatory or disease uh, fighting regulatory framework. Uh, he was censored probably by an algorithm on, I guess it was Facebook or Twitter, I forget. And uh, they, uh, you know, the, his, his business was cut in half. His, the income from his podcast was cut in half. So he said, you know, heck with this, I'm going to sue him. Yeah, well, some of these fact checks or misinformation labels or whatever they want to put on there are actually generally ridiculous. They're like the Babylon Bee, you know, it's satire. It's clearly satire, but they're going to put a misinformation label on it. Well, yeah, no one was looking at it to get actual genuine information from a satire site. And these people have lost their, they've literally lost their mind. But in a strange way, it's actually become kind of an opposite. It's almost a badge of honor now when you see something with a misinformation label on it. It's like, oh, well, Facebook, they made Facebook mad. They made somebody mad. You know, it's, it's become this strange thing. It's, it doesn't do what they think it does. And so now it's become, I don't know. You, you almost wonder who runs these things. Do these people yeah. actually understand human psychology? Do they? Well, I, I mean, I think Mark Zuckerberg is the, is the, is the poster boy for the uh, the you know the guy that will do whatever it takes in order to uh, continue to make more money uh and if that means kowtowing to uh dc kowtow away uh I, I mean i'm active on facebook and i post a lot of stuff and i've noticed that for whatever reason i used to get lots of shares and lots of likes and lots of uh followers now uh i can put something up and if i get two or three likes and two or three shares i'm lucky is that because what I'm posting has become less popular, or is that because of an algorithm that's saying, "Nah, let's let's relegate that to to the dustbin. We don't want we don't want that uh, seeing the light of day." I have no way of proving one thing or the other, but the uh, the objective evidence would in indicate that uh, that Facebook and probably Twitter are manipulating the uh, amount of viewing that those who don't kowtow to the party line uh, are able to get. And that's what uh, John Stossel, that's, a, that's a, a, a milder version of what uh, John Stossel had to put up with. He had to put up with also the, uh, the, uh, the fact check uh, banner. And I've had that a couple of occasions too. Misinformation banner, whatever, I think part, um, what is it? Missing information banner a lot. It's a yeah. missing context. That's the one I get. It's missing context a lot. I get the missing context one a lot. You morons. I get, I get sick of them. But, you know, whatever. It's The algorithms are no longer organic. It, or the Google search engine, for that matter. They're no longer organic. These things became popular because their algorithms acted in an organic way. You kind of had an organic reach. But now they're so manipulated to what somebody else wants not even what the advertisers want anymore. It used to be kind of what the advertisers would want. You could kind of trust it. Oh, and so, no, it no, it's what the regulators and the and what the what the what the executive branch and the and the legislature, what the federal government wants. Yeah. Well, well, speaking about the federal government, we're going to go ahead and move on. Daniel Hale, he was the soldier who was sentenced for re releasing the information on uh, drone strikes, was recently uh, sentenced. Forty-five months of memory serves. Because apparently crimes against policy are worse than crimes against humanity. Uh, apparently you can use, you know, drone strikes to kill families, and that's fine. No one gets punished for that. But you release the information about drone strikes killing innocent families, you go to jail. I, there's just so much backwards about what our government is doing to itself. It's, you know, I actually sometimes lose the ability to comprehend it. Just the moral... Yeah. Well, I mean... It, when you have a, a welfare warfare state and throw in uh, health care um, complex and education complex as well, you have uh, a group of people who move back and forth between government and so-called private industry. And the, the warfare state, the military industrial complex is probably, it's the granddaddy and probably still the most powerful. And they want to have absolute impunity to do whatever you know, a lot to to sell arms is, is their motivation, and government players want to have absolute impunity to conduct wars uh, without any uh, blowback. Without from the U.S., they're going to get blowback from the countries that were invading or trying to or in, interfering in civil wars, etc. But they don't want any blowback from the American people. They don't want people, the, the voters of the United States, to see that 
not only are we killing so-called enemy combatants, but we're also killing their families and totally innocent women and children. The most recent example, of course, the drone strike in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Afghanistan, which uh, didn't hit terrorists, it hit a bunch of, uh, of innocents. And uh, when you think about it, no declared war, even now, ever, uh, in Afghanistan, only the authorization of military force. Uh, what's the line between uh, a, 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 a war crime and a mistake? Uh, and I, I think that uh, if you subject the, the uh, droning incidents in which innocents have been killed to enough uh, magnification people will kind of figure out that is, you know, beyond uh, accidental, beyond, uh, you know, an innocent mistake and veers into the direction of being a war crime. And if you start talking about war crimes, that goes all the way to the Oval Office. Uh, those, I mean, those, those uh, authorizations of the military force uh, don't start at the PFC level. They don't start at the uh, general staff level. They, they, they're authorized ultimately by the president of the United States. And, and nobody wants, no politician, particularly no president, wants to wants to be uh, in that hot seat. Yeah, well, in order to have a war crime, you actually have to have a declared war. So at this stage, it's not even a war crime. It's just, yeah. what, mass murder? Well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I don't want to hold the, the drone pilot necessarily responsible because essentially he's following orders. Now, yeah. that's kind of a weak excuse, but he has... There are people who are responsible for giving him that order, and those people should be held responsible. Well, yeah, re realistically, everybody involved should be held responsible. Uh, responsible, uh, and certainly the, the the least responsibility goes to the people on the front lines. The most responsibility goes to the highest echelons of the decision making process, and uh, that's certainly the highest levels of of the military, and in many cases reaches uh, into the. Uh, into the administration of the United States. Yeah, but we can't be holding the administrations responsible for their behavior, can we? That's, so that's we, the issue. So we only, throw only whistleblowers, only the the Snowdens and the uh, uh, Hales and the uh, uh, the, the rest uh, that uh, the uh, Assanges, the people who are uh, telling people what uh, the government doesn't think they should have the right to know. Yeah, and it and it continues um, as we move on to another topic. The U.S. schools are reporting a, sor a shortage of teachers and staff while they're going ahead and firing unvaccinated teachers and staff. And it's not just schools. Hospitals are having the same issue as they fire, you know, people who are a year ago perfectly fine working unvaccinated, but now all of a sudden they're too dangerous to work, and so they've got to be fired. It, we've, we are losing our sense of humanity, whether we, you know, it doesn't matter what you feel about COVID or how dangerous these things are. We have lost our sense of humanity where we're, we're making decisions based upon fear, not a based based upon rational thought. And well, yeah, I mean, and, and the fear is a fear of a real disease, and it's legitimate. I mean, it is reasonable to be afraid of anything that can kill you, whether it's the, whether it's uh, the COVID or whether it's uh, uh, chickenpox or whether it's uh, diphtheria or, or whatever. And we have vaccines against most of those, you know, most of the. Uh, uh, killers of, of years past, everything from polio to diphtheria to uh, uh, smallpox, et cetera, and so on. And those have worked remarkably well. The vaccine against uh, COVID works, but only if I understand correctly, and uh, medical people can correct me, but if I understand correctly, it works only in reducing the severity of the uh, COVID disease. It does not stop people from getting it, hence we have a whole lot of breakthrough cases. It may, it may limit the, the amount of uh, infections, but it doesn't stop them. And once infected, those people can, al can also, you know, be uh, spreaders of the disease. Um, and, you know, which is, argues against vaccination in a sense, but it also argues in favor of it. I mean, I, I'm vaccinated uh, twice and I'm gonna get the third vaccination, uh, I think next month or the, or the month after whenever it's available. Because I, you know, I would r much rather have a, a mild case of the disease than a than a severe case of the disease. Uh, but I'm also, rec you know, cognizant of the fact that the vaccination is not going to vaccinations in general are not going to be the be all and end all and you know 
end COVID. It's just not going to happen. It's a virus. It mutates. There's multiple. Uh, you have to learn Greek in order to keep up with the, the, the various uh, mutations. And I'm not very good at Greek. Uh, so we, we have a situation where nobody ever actually took a look at the uh, trade-offs between shutting down the economy uh, a year ago or more and the, num the number of people who would uh, actually get a severe case of, of uh, coronavirus. And had they done uh, a uh, look at the actual trade-off, they would have seen that among the young, the uh, severity and the death rate of COVID is remarkably low, comparable to other ordinary maladies like the seasonal flu, uh, a little bit worse, but, but not significantly worse. Among the elderly, significantly worse, and so, you know, the, the reasonable response would have been to advise, not require, not mandate, but advise that those with comorbidities, namely the elderly, the obese, uh, with uh, people with severe uh, in, uh, immune system compromises and so forth, advise that they do all of the social distancing and masking and so on that uh, do have an effect on uh, stopping the transmission of the disease but also to say those who have a low risk of morbidity to go about their lives. The Swedish model that comes to mind, their death rate is no higher than the United States death rate. And they have not had the economic shutdown that we had to suffer through. Meantime, their emergency rooms, their hospital rooms, uh, their uh, uh, intensive care units have room for others who are suffering who are being shut out of the emergency rooms and ICUs and so forth in the United States for people that uh, that uh, have mild cases and perhaps don't need to be uh, treated in ICUs. Uh, it, you know, it's just it's just a total a total a total uh, willful ignorance of trade-offs that we uh, succumb to, that we succumb to largely on the on the advice of people who are doctors first and uh, policymakers, not at all. Yeah, and and I, I need to be careful though because I was vaccinated and I'm now having long-term health issues because of it. And so like, you're very blurry for me today, Richard. I can <laughs> and part of that is because of my reaction to the vaccine. And these are very effective pretreatments. I've been telling you, I've been saying this for a year. The data shows they are highly effective pretreatments. But they don't work like we think traditional vaccines work. And that's actually, it's a perception problem as much of anything. It's we think vaccines prevent you from getting the disease. That's what we think vaccines do. And this is a, this is a pretreatment. It prevents you from having a severe reaction to the vaccine or lessens the chance of you having a severe reaction to the vaccine. I mean, to the, to the disease. And but so when we, we think a vaccine is one thing, but this is actually something different. And when we get the data, there, we lose some trust to it. And, you know, it's just, we've lost our humanity and we are losing our time. We are out of time, Richard. We've got to go. I want to thank you guys for joining us. Be back next week and we should have uh, Richard Bode on, hopefully. Yeah, back. Richard Bode, a long time libertarian, goes back to the early 90s at least. Yeah, and so we hope to come back for us and we'll see you then. And for those of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, please remember to love everybody.